So Whitehead uses the phrase intensity of satisfaction to describe the feeling of concrescence and what is being achieved in the process whereby the many become one and are increased by one, or the process whereby the perished past uh, progresses into the future, or processes, and it, the past passes into the future through the present, always through the present. Uh, we are never not present. Past and future are relative to the present. Space for Whitehead is in the present. He calls it presentational immediacy. It's the extended domain, right? Res, res extensa in Descartes' terms, right? And then this this extended domain, though, what he calls it the extensive continuum, the realm of extension or extensity is only half the picture. And in fact, to even call it half the picture is already to privilege the domain of extensity over the other domain of intensity, to say it's only half as if 50% was external and 50% was internal or was intensity instead of extensity is, is already to privilege the quantitative um, the quantitative dimension of the external and the mathematizable and um, computable and binary, um, or Tim Eastman would say the, the, the Boolean domain, the, the, the domain that can be measured in bits, in ones and zeros, that's the domain of extension. And that's where it even makes sense to talk about 50% um, or half or ratio of this kind. In the realm of intensity, we need... The, the old rationality doesn't work anymore because you're in a domain that cannot be measured, cannot be digitized. It's the, the realm of intensity. And when Whitehead talks about the satisfaction of an actual occasion of experience, the intensity of satisfaction in a concrescence, he's talking about feeling. He's talking about something subjective, something aesthetic something which cannot be um, spread out in a, in a grid or a coordinate grid of some kind, something that's not in space-time, right? The realm of intensity or of concrescence or prehension, the realm of feeling, it's not in space-time. Space-time, extended space and time, are expressions of networks of occasions. So sp space and time emerge out of the collective behavior of actual occasions of experience as a result of what these occasions of experience find satisfying. So the very gravitational gradient of space-time, the energetic dynamics of light, these are functions of feeling and functions of feelings of enjoyment and that the the shape that the cosmos takes as we measure it in the extensive domain is a result of a precipitate of an achievement of an activity that which is underway uh, inwardly that doesn't appear in the measurable domain. But that is, uh, well, you could say it's what does the peering, right? It is it is the subject side of the equation, if we want to use those terms. And so when we talk about intensity of satisfaction, um, what we mean to say is that there is a, um, there is a aesthetic achievement whereby the, the perished objects of the past are brought together under contrast with one another. They're prehended, and uh, these prehensions of the many objects of the perished past grow together into 
a new unity, a new whole of some kind, which has an associated experiential vector to it. A telic, you know, an, an aiming unfolding that feels its way forward. You know, it falls forward into the lowest uh, energy state, you could say. But it, to, to, to talk about energy in the extensive domain for Whitehead and the intensive domain is just to talk about experience or emotion, not conscious deliberation or imagination or any of the, you know, high-grade consciousness that we human uh, beings experience, but a lower form of feeling is just a vector feeling. It's just a gravitational gradient. It's just the inheritance of the vibratory frequency of a helium atom repetition of that frequency which is the repetition of that feeling right of that vector feeling is a phrase whitehead uses a very simple form of feeling at that scale of nature but this very these very simple feelings um they amplify themselves as they cycle as they become recursive and when the geological and astrophysical conditions are right for a planet to ripen into life, when those um, improbability sinks, if you will, uh, are sheltered by environmental conditions, various reliable rhythms in the environment that afford the emergence of uh, chemical selection, combinatorial selection and uh, protocellular evolution right? in these progenitor communities. The origin of life is a community, right? Not a single heroic cell. It's a heroic community. And so, you know, Bruce likes to say that um, the universe before life, right, the physical and, and um, astrophysical galactic environments, they get a D for creativity, he says, in the sense that they, very few, relatively few forms of organization are found, and they're just fixed, they're locked in place, um, and no further evolution can transpire. This is what ergodicity refers to, right? And it wasn't until the biological realm where you got uh, template copying and these self-repairing complex adaptive uh, cells. It wasn't until that point that the creativity ratcheted up, but, but the, the whole point of the um, progenitor theory that Bruce is developing is that it was a, a network of uh, polymers at the edge of these freshwater ponds that would be uh, drying out and refilling drying out and refilling and along the edges of these ponds this these the process of dehydration would catalyze the formation of um, longer polymers of RNA of peptides and, and amino acids and you end up with um, the chains the complex um, worms, molecular worms, and, and you know, in some ways, Bruce would say machines, these molecular machines, I would think of them more as molecular organisms, and, you know, we just have to come up with our definitions for these words and agree. If we're going to use a certain definition of machine, then sure, I guess we can say that. 
But uh, the thing about the universe before life getting a D, I think that's fine. I agree with Bruce about that, in the, a D in creativity. The point is that it's not an F. Right? It's enough creativity to keep the evolutionary process going forward. Yeah, at a slower rate than life is able to evolve. But it's not an F. It's enough. A D is at least some degree of aim and of sat of, of uh, effective satisfaction so that the the lure of deeper intensity which I think we could also correlate with um, with probably with improbability um, the lure of intensity is a is a lure towards improbability and so, and it's also the free energy, the lowest free energy state that, that uh, organized matter tends to adopt. And Whitehead's just saying, like, that tendency is an aim toward order that is driven or goaded by the, the lure of enjoyment and satisfaction. Right? And so he's trying to give physics animacy again, you could say. He's trying to give physics a soul, you know, hence the title of my book. Physics of the World Soul. So none of this, you know, Whiteheadian sort of panpsychist or pan-experientialist language is meant to discount physics in the realm of extensity. It's just a uh, reintegration of the realm of intensity and yeah, I think a prioritization of the realm of intensity, even though it's not like you could have one without the other, is just that you can't understand the shapes taken in space without giving intensity its due. Natura naturans, right? Not just naturata, the external shapes, but naturans, the creative process.